welcome this evening to which we are committed to having a great program here at Lake of the Torches. Um, so I want to welcome everyone here. My name is Pam Taylor, and I am the current president of the League of Women Voters of the North Woods. And we've been uh, pulling this program together for a long time, so we're glad to be here <laughs> and having it go. We acknowledge that we are standing on the ancestral lands of the Lake Superior Chippewa Indians, who have been stewards of this land for centuries and respect the interconnected relationship among everything on this land. We acknowledge the many legacies of violence, boarding schools, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together today. We pay respect to their elders, past, present, and future. And I would be very proud to welcome to the podium from the Lac de Flambeau Tribal Council, um, Eric Chapman and Ray Allen. Uh, Buju, uh, welcome to Waswaganing, um, the place that we know as uh, our homeland, which refers to um, people of the torch. Centuries ago, as the fur uh, trappers explored this area, they came across um, these lights dancing upon the water, and they named it Lac du Flambeau. Lake of the Flames. It's an honor to uh, welcome you here today at the uh, Lake of the Torches Convention Center and to Waswaganing. Uh, my name is Eric Chapman. I'm a tribal council member for the Lac du Flambeau Band. have served for approximately 14 years. I've also served on the Voight Intertribal Task Force for approximately eight years, which um, together with the state of Wisconsin, co-managed the treaty resources within um, the uh, ceded territory. I've also worked as a um, tribal employee for the last 30 years uh, on my homeland here uh, in a natural resource field. So I've, I've, I've seen a lot of, um, you know, a lot of our uh, spirit relatives and we call, you know, um, those plants, those animals, those fish, and those other beings that grow from the earth are spirit relatives because our teachings tell us that everything has a purpose here and everything here has a spirit, whether it's a rock, a tree, a walleye, an eagle, it all has a spirit and it all has a place here. I would also like to um, extend a welcome to our our. Uh, our elders here, um, whether you're a Native American or not, you know, you're an elder, I respect you, and I'll listen to you. I'd also like to welcome um, the uh, main presenter today, Miss Jenny Van Sickle of the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. Today's event, the an introduction to treaty rights, tribal sovereignty, and ceded territories is a very important topic. We hope this will inspire conversation and open up your, your ears, open up your heart, and we hope that you understand our perspective of what treaty rights, tribal sovereignty, and ceded territory means to us. I would also like to thank the um, League of Women Voters of the Northwoods American Association of University of Women, WXPR Public Radio, and the Lac Flamo Band, Alex Superior Chippewa Indians, for hosting this event this evening. I'd also like to um, acknowledge the, uh, the uh, women behind the scenes that are making this event possible tonight. Um, Beth, Pam, and Joan, thank you. The um, topics tonight are especially important to me. Um, first, I would like to mention tribal sovereignty. And I'm sure some of you are aware that in order to be an independent nation, 
you know, you have to govern yourselves, make decisions that are best for you. And, you know, that's what's referred to as being a sovereign. Um, it's the ability to uh, self-govern yourself. Uh, once you're recognized as a sovereign, you have the authority to make treaties. Treaties are agreements with, between other nations, and you know, those treaties have provisions or language that is um, uh, recognized. Also, you know, once you have that treaty and you're given something up, there's ceded territories that um, make make mention of you know, this is what we're given up, but you know we expect something in return. And I'm sure um, Ms. Sickle will, Van Sickle will get into that in more detail. Um, so with that, I just wanna, again, welcome a chance to broaden your understanding of treaty rights, tribal sovereignty, and ceded territory. We hope that this session opens up your eyes, your ears, and your heart to um, get a better understanding of how we see things and to um, also um, acknowledge, you know, uh, um, those mothers, those women, and the water that they stand over and protect. Um, I just want to say thank you for, for uh, putting a, all of us here on Mother Earth. With that, I'll uh, allow Councilman Ray Allen to uh, continue. somebody's computer. Buju everyone. So hello, hello. Uh um Buju um Nigan Agabo Indigenous Nakaz was swagging in Dujuba Makwa Nindu Dame. So hi everyone. Um Ray Allen. Um I'm happy to yield to my uh senior uh councilman uh, Eric Chapman for uh letting him go first to talk about different topics. And so we actually didn't compare notes or anything so that's why I was trying to figure I'm like what can I talk about and touch on that would be relevant, but then also like wouldn't step on um, Eric's toes or cover things that have already been talked about before or aren't going to be talked about by our presenters. So um, I have some thoughts on some things, but beforehand I just wanted to quickly say that and add the disclaimer that my words and my thoughts are my own and do not represent my employers and then also the Lacta Flambeau tribe and I'm speaking as an individual. And I also wanted to extend a thank you to the organizers for in co-inviting um, me to come give an introduction as well. So, um, so as opposed to Eric, I've only been on council for about half a year at this point, so it's uh, a little bit junior still. So it's been a, a fun uh, opportunity and experience at the moment. But um, so for those who don't know me, along with being a council member, I'm also a scientist, so I'm a researcher. So I've been trained in uh, Western academia and have gone through uh, undergraduate and graduate school and. I become a scientist and my whole thing is questioning the things that are around us and like looking at it through a critical lens. And so something that I wanted to talk about that um, is kind of talk about like the context of what, um, the topics that are being addressed today. So a lot of you have already seen the topics and most of you or some of you may even know that some of these topics like sovereignty is older than the US itself. So these topics. Um, and I see that as being the big question tonight that I want to address is like, what are these topics, specifically treaty rights, tribal sovereignty, and ceded territory? And with the kind of that information in mind, I wanted to comment on, I wanted to comment on that tonight and then also encourage folks to continue investigating after this event, um, the context, the history, and the meaning behind these words and phrases that are being used, especially how they are based in the dominant and colonial language of English. Um, so in the beginning, I talked a little bit in Ojibwe Moen, but right now we are talking in a settler colonial language. So the one, the one term that I want to focus down on and kind of give an example of the one that I'm the most critical of is the topic of ceded territory. So we see it mentioned here at this event. We see it casually used just about every day in what is currently called Wisconsin. We see it used in maps. We see it used in formal documents and informal addresses and presentations of folks. And even looking at it at this short word of seeded, it instills a lot of loaded assumptions into it. So such as these were fair and equitable agreements between two consenting entities. But if I came to you all, or if you think about it in a hypothetical situation, if a group or individuals came to you and your family or your community and imposed their own rules, expectations and culture onto you and forced you to give up your home with no other options, 
would you feel comfortable having your home called a, be called a seated home? Again, we have this idea of like, oh, seated means like they yielded it, like they willingly gave it up. But I want to uh, question that a lot. Yep. Oh, sorry. It's, hopefully people have been able to hear me a little bit. So <laughs> should I start over, everybody? <laughs> so, so talking about the concept of seated is like what I'm trying to get folks to think about more. Um, so every time I hear the word seated, and when it's referred to my homelands, my skin crawls a little bit. So my family, friends, and community's home and my other non-human relations home has been boiled down to this, this two-word phrase of ceded territory. So words are important. Uh, I was taught that by professors and many of the folks in my community as well. And understanding their full history and the context that they're used in is one of the most important things folks can do when talking about these topics today and in the future. So I just wanted to offer that kind of like more academic perspective and kind of like, let's look at it and think about it in that context. So with that, I'll um, say miigwech for uh, listening to me. And uh, I hope you all leave today's event wanting to learn more and do some uh, repairing of some of the damages that were done these past uh, couple hundred years. So with that, miigwech. <laughs> I'm gonna go practice my treaty rights right now, everybody. So All right. I'm gonna run out, but if you guys see you on the other, <laughs> on the other side. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. Um, <clears throat> I just briefly wanna um, say that the League of Women Voters of the Northwoods, we are committed to educating voters and defending democracy. We want everyone to vote, anybody who who can vote, we want them to vote. We spend much time um, working throughout the North Woods to register people to vote and also provide important programs so that we are an educated electorate. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce my dear friend and partner from AAUW, Cheryl Hansen who will let you know a little bit about AAUW. This is not a great position to be in when you're eager to hear about the uh, treaty rights. But um, we are very proud, as, uh, American Association of University Women, to be co-sponsoring this event. Uh, we are very eager as partners with community groups. The mission of AAUW, we are not a women's um, social clutch group. We actually have a mission, and that is to advance equity for women and girls through advocacy, education, philanthropy, and research. And we have three main policy positions that uh, we are dedicated to this year, uh, briefly, just to preserve a strong system of public education. Not private education, public education. To, <laughs> to achieve self-sufficiency for all women and to guarantee equality, individual rights, and social justice in a diverse society. Um, one of our main thrusts in our local group is to fund scholarships for women returning to Nicolay College. Um, our, job is to, our job is to uplift other women, to give them a better life. Uh, we do that mainly through fund two fundraisers a year. One is we do something called Elves Market around the holidays. Some of you may have been, have been there. This is a big event. There are about 100 women who gather, and we have a great time, but we raise quite a bit of money for those scholarships. And then the other thing we do is we have a gently used book sale at Rhinelander High School, the third uh, week in July every year, and you may have seen that too. Uh, we fund five different scholarships, uh, mainly in the areas of uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and one in public safety. Uh, we had one young woman this year, I got the pleasure of meeting her, who is a, going to be a fierce young police officer. Um, and then we also fund uh, something for uh, student leaders, women student leaders. Uh, on the first Monday of the month, we offer educational programs. It's open to anybody who is interested. They're uh, very 
challenging and topic challenging. And then on the third Monday of each month, we have a book group. And we read a wide variety of uh, work. And the every, again, it's open to everybody. And the discussions are always lively. Um, if our mission and our goals appeal to you, uplifting women and in the society, uh, we always, always welcome you to join us. Um, I also wanted to tell you, I'm actually the president-elect. The truth is, Pam is the current president. It's just that she probably didn't want to be up here, and, um, she, but she's our leader extraordinaire. I have big shoes to fill. Um, it's also my pleasure to introduce Beth Tornis, who's going to introduce our speaker. Um, Beth is a long-term resident of Lac de Flambeau, and she is also on the board of directors of the League of Women Voters. But I know Beth best as a poet extraordinaire. Uh, if you ever get a chance to read her work, it's really worthwhile. So I'm done, Beth. <laughs> Good evening. Um, I'd like to first of all introduce um, um, my friend and a spiritual leader here in Lac de Flambeau, Biscacane, Greg Johnson, who will, who will bring us together as one with his opening prayer. Miigwech. My English name is Greg Johnson. I come from Lac de Flamo. I'm a tribal member. I'm a teacher, an educator, and a father of five children. So I'm broke all the time. <laughs> What I want to talk about is a word that we have here. It's called Ishkanaganing. Can you guys say Ishkanaganing? What that means is the reservation you're sitting on right now. But that word literally translates to what's left over. So that's what we got here. I want you to remember that word, Ishkanaganing. It's a heavy word that we carry around. So when I say where I'm from, Waswaganing, Ishkanaganing. I was actually going to offer a prayer here, but everybody already ate, so we usually do that before we eat. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my version of treaty rights coming from the traditional side instead of doing the prayer. And it might, uh, light bulb might go on a little bit for you guys. So um, treaty rights weren't only signed by Native people. They were signed by your ancestors as well. And so... Uh, we do our best to hold up our end of the treaty rights. And as American citizens, it's your job, your responsibility, to hold up your end of the treaty rights that your ancestors signed as well. And so we have to remind people of these things. You know, I'm an educator in the public school here in the high school. My job isn't to educate American people. It's not my job. You guys are supposed to get that in your education systems, and unfortunately, you're not getting it. And that's a, a real truth that has to be talked about today. And so, as voters and as leaders in your own communities and your areas where you come from, reach out and make that happen because it's not happening enough. I was one of the people that was shot at on the boat landing in 2021. You guys probably heard about that on Little St. Germain. There was myself, one of my teachers. There was also another uh, educator from Oneida. And there was also a uh, combat veteran in the boat. And we took fire that night. And so understanding treaty rights is not only our responsibility. It's the, the uh, I was going to say gentleman, but the man that shot at us, the system had failed him on treaty rights. And so he took it upon himself to express his distaste for the misunderstanding of treaty rights that gives him the clean fish, the clean water, the clean air, and all that. So um, again, I, I represent the traditional community here in Lac de Flambeau. 
And again, you know, I was going to do a prayer, but, you know, uh, I just wanted to say that much. And so where we come from here, it's a very special place. Prior to the establishment of the reservation, the land that my friend Ray was talking about and, and Eric ceded, ceded land, it was massive. So think of Highway 29, Central Wisconsin, all the way up basically to the Canadian border. That's our land. Okay, so has anybody been born, was anybody here born in Manaqua? Wausau, Rhinelander, Eagle River, anywhere in northern Wisconsin? You're born in Ojibwe territory. So you were born in our territory. That's the way we look at it. So there's a lot of uh, borders, there's a lot of um, fences, there's a lot of things on this land that wasn't there when my great-grandfather was alive. And I had uh, one of my relatives, her name was Ayanji Gokwe. She was born in 1824. She was born in Mosinee, Wisconsin. If you would have went there in 1824 and said, where are you from? Being from Mosinee, Wisconsin, she would have said, Waswaganing, Ishkaniganing, Indunjaba. Or prior to Ishkaniganing, Waswaganing, Indunjaba. I come from Waswaganing. And Waswaganing went from south of Wasa all the way up to, to where uh, Waters Meet Michigan was, or is currently. They went from Pelican Lake all the way over to the other side of, of um, Mercer, Wisconsin. It was huge. And so now we have Ishkaniganing, what's left over. And so I just want to leave that with you, something to ponder as these, these professionals come up here and, and tell you about who we are and where we come from. So I just want to say that much. Miigwech. Thank you. Miigwech, Greg. Um, now I have the honor of introducing our presenter for this evening, Jenny Van Sickle. Jenny Van Sickle is the Outreach Specialist at the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. Jenny graduated with honors from the University of Maine, Augusta, where she earned her Associate of Science in Mental Health and Human Services and went on to complete her Bachelor in, of Science in Social Work at the University of Wisconsin-Superior. In 2019, Jenny was recognized by the Leadership Institute as their inaugural Woman of Excellence, and in 2020, was included as one of Wisconsin's 38 most influential natives by Madison 365. Please welcome with me Ms. Jenny Van Sickle. Thank you. Okay, here we go. We can hear okay? Okay. I just suddenly got so nervous. Okay. I braided as much courage as I could into my hair tonight. So please be so patient with me. Gunak chish, miigwech. Thank you. My name is Jenny Van Sickle, and I am Klingit at the Baskin Sheetka Kwankak Sariyech Kajahin. And I am just so happy to be here. I want to thank the Lacta Flambeau Nation. I want to thank the community at large and the Tribal Council for supporting tonight's event. I want to thank the League of Women Voters, Pam, Beth, Cheryl, and all of you for choosing to be here tonight. Um, I was really so honored to be here. When I think of the League of Women Voters, I think about how each of you is such a pillar in your own community, how you have been such defenders of democracy and policy professionals. So give yourself a round of applause. I want tonight to feel a little bit interactive. So I want, um, there might be opportunities where I say, you know, do something like this and I just want you to feel free to holler out as long as it's nice, and um, in response to what I asked. Um, you know, 
I, I'm not here to um, convince anybody or persuade anybody. Um, I'm, I'm just here um, to hopefully offer the limited perspective I have humbly. I, um, I want this to be casual. So, you know, we'll spend some time getting to know each other a little bit. And um, we'll talk about the organization I work for, Glyphwick, the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. And um, we'll talk a bit about treaty rights and sovereignty. If you hear me use words that you have already heard tonight in a different sense, I want you always to defer to the expertise of the community, the preference of the community. If you hear one perspective from a community, and then you say, well, Glyphwick said, nah. You already knew, right? So my mentor always said, you can't unknow what you know. So I don't expect anybody to be a, an expert in federal Indian law when we're done here today. Um, I just um, will cover the basics. Does that sound like a deal? Is that OK? OK. Wow, <laughs> I feel so famous. Okay, <laughs> I, um, like I said, my name is Jenny Van Sickle and I'm the Outreach Specialist for the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. I am Flingit and Guna Ana Yech Nachs Ayachet Kaksadi Gaganhit Shitkakwan is my full family title, first of her name. Uh, and all of that information lets you know that I um, am born and raised in Sitka, Alaska. That is my Kwan, that is my family. I am of the Raven Clan, and um, my, fro my crest is frog, and I'm from the, the Kiksadi house, um, sorry, the sun house. So in Klingit culture, our moieties, you can be one of two, you can be eagle, or you can be raven. Whatever your mother is is where your heritage lies. So my mother was a raven. I am a raven. Our moieties are then divided into clans, and each clan has a crest. And each crest then is divided up into a house. Got it? And um, I also have a passion for policy, and that's why I studied social work. So I'll do my best to keep up tonight, OK? Any questions about Alaska before we move on? You will always see the raven and the frog together. You see them depicted there. Our, um, our traditional colors are red and black. Whenever I feel a little bit nervous, I will speak my original language um, because the teaching says if you speak your language, your ancestors will come to comfort you. Or you might see me a red black earrings to feel um, just to feel a little bit taken care of. But you'll always see the frog and um, raven together. The saying around being the lowest on the totem pole is not a thing. Let's stop saying it. This is, of course, um, when people learn that I'm from Alaska, a lot of times I hear, are you Eskimo? No. I'm not, and of the 574 federally recognized tribes in the United States, 228 of them are in the state of Alaska. It's a big state with many nations that have, um, if you don't know the history in Alaska, we'll move fast, but um, the Alaskan territory was sold to the United States after being invaded by Russian forces. And it was sold to the United States for less than two cents per acre, January 3rd of 1959, with no consultation or consent from Alaska Native people. I always caution folks to resist painting Native people with a broad brush. We know that. Um, what it means to be Native is different to every single person, every single culture. Um, and when you look at this picture of Alaska, you can see five primary nations. Um, each of them have unique language, dialects, cultures, traditions, history, foods, stories. And geography pays a, plays a really big part in that. If the folks that are in Inupiaq territory up in the orange there, they're not going to have the same access to food um, 
as to, like where I'm from in the green. I was raised in the southern panhandle, which is a tropical rainforest. So when I say it's cold here, I mean it. <laughs> People here are like, well, you're from Alaska. Isn't this like summer? I'll, I'll fight you. Oh, sorry, I forgot we're recording. OK. Um, <laughs> It rains like 300 days a year. It's soaking wet, and uh, I miss it a great deal. This is me at culture camp. I am in the super cool Pee Wee Herman shirt um, <laughs> down there. And um, that is my cousin Star holding the hand drum. That's my cousin Violet right behind me, who's a big MMIW rock star up in Anchorage, and her brother Martin's a big movie star now. Um, but these are the people that I learned to dry fish with, the people that I learned to bead with. I went to Yakutat every single summer um, to make sure that I would be a knowledgeable Indian. So this is some of the most special memories I have. All right, here's the United States. Let's look at the United States. Across the United States, there are approximately 400 treaties. Treaties are nation-to-nation -nation contracts. They are not exclusive to Native Americans. You might know the terminology, the Treaty of Paris. That was signed by the United States and British representatives on September 3rd of 1783, ending the Revolutionary War the American Revolution. Treaties have the same effect and force of federal statutes. Violating a treaty is equivalent of violating federal law. And this is my last Alaska slide, I swear. <laughs> and I show you this map because you've seen it a million times. The map here in color is the map Alaskan kids grew up seeing. We knew that Alaska was large enough to cover the United States. Let's see if I remember this. Alaska touches all the way out here, all the way up to nearly Canada, all the way down to Florida. But when you saw this map a thousand times in school, you saw it like the black and white version where you would see Alaska like somewhere in the Gulf of I don't know where. And it was often really small and I think by Hawaii. And um, I would get questions when I was in school and college like, is that a part of the United States? Yes. Um, so I, I only show you this. Um, because I want you to challenge the perspective of something you have seen over and over throughout your entire life and be willing to challenge that. Deal? OK. Um, often when I'm asked to give these presentations, sometimes the organizers will say, well, let's just do one on one. Because I, you know, I really don't think anybody has any cultural exposure or um, there's no experience in Ojibwe culture or Native nations. And I think that, that they mean that authentically, but I think what they mean is that the exposure maybe is not always positive or maybe that it's not always accurate, right? So these are very familiar images, and we won't spend an, uh, a long time looking at it. There are entire college courses on Native American depiction in the media, so we won't get too far into it, but we do have exposure, right? Uh, fortunately, we know the zeitgeist is shifting. There's hope, and things are turning around. We have you know, productions like Molly from Denali, Reservation Dogs. There are really good podcasts out there, social media platforms like TikTok, you know, to find creators and content that are speaking their own authentic experiences and celebrating their heritage. All right, Glyphwick. So Glyphwick is about to turn 40. And we were formed um, in 1983 by the tribes to assist with natural resource management protection through pairing indigenous expertise in the modern sciences. So I want to show you the structure just a little bit, OK? So here are sovereign tribal nations. And Glyphwick is here. We have a board of commissioners. We have 11. 
tribal nations in our membership. Each of those, mem each of those nations has a seat here. We also have the Voight Task Force. We'll talk more about that in just a second. And then we have the Lakes Committee. So our um, membership that is on the Big Lake, Gechigami, Lake Superior, we have that representation here. We have um, primarily two treaties represented through the Voight Task Force. And Glyphwick staff supports the directive of tribal nations. Sometimes there's this narrative that Glyphwick, that tribes work for us or that um, Glyphwick can tell people what to do or, um, but that's none of that is the case. Um, Glyphwick is not a paternal organization. Um, we take our directive, we are here to help tribal nations um, with off-reservation treaty harvest. And we'll talk more about that too in a second, but I just want to illustrate that they are separate, they are connected, um, but we are, if um, we have a tribal nation that is doing, you know, complicated uh, manumen or wild rice restoration, they might, you know, take on that initiative and then ask Glyphwick researchers to help in support with that effort by um, looking at zebra mussels in the area or something like that. So we're there to help. We are um, additional staff and capacity to help tribes accomplish their stated goals. Any questions about that before we move on? We're just getting started, don't worry. Um, show of hands, let's see. Who knows how many federally recognized tribes are in the state you are in right now? Okay, two of you. How about anybody at this table, take a guess. How many federally recognized tribes in the state of Wisconsin? It's okay to just guess. 32. 32 is a guess. 10? There are 11 federally recognized tribes in the state of Wisconsin. That's okay. <laughs> um, the bonus question though is there are 12 nations in the state of Wisconsin and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Any, any guesses how many federally recognized tribes in the state of Minnesota? Guess this table? 10. 10, pretty close, there are 11. 11. <laughs> we'll, we'll cut that so you guess correctly. Um, about half are Ojibwe and about half are Dakota. Um, and finally, this table over here, how many federally recognized tribes in the state of Michigan? <laughs> that's where I would, that's what I would say. There are 12. There are 12 in the state of Michigan. Here is a map. You may have seen it. I know that some of you have been reading the Treaty Rights Guide. This is a list of our membership. So we, ha we work with three nations in the state of Michigan, six in the state of Wisconsin, and two in the state of Minnesota. We work with 11 tribes across what is now three states and four treaties. Each treaty is unique. Each treaty, does it, it doesn't necessarily mean that Every single nation has um, transference through the signatories. It's really about which nations signed the 1836 treaty, for example. That doesn't mean that those treaty rights are the same over there and up, uh, up in 1854. So a lot of our work is proactive around education, um, whether that's with native communities or non-native communities. Does anybody have any idea what the little red squares are? Reservations. reservations, yes. So when you look at the map this way, are reservations large or small? They're pretty small. Now, if fishing is a big part of your livelihood, that makes it pretty tough when you're in a situation like this, right? the nation of Mille Lacs. I'm sure that wasn't on purpose. <laughs> um, you'll notice the water is included. So in 1836, the Treaty of Washington is nearly 40% of the state of Michigan. 
and you can see that Bay Mills has, um, you know, it neighbors on Lake Michigan, but we primarily um, work on the Lake Superior side, but this does extend out into the water. So that um, is an important distinction as well. There are over 300 reservations across the United States. So for example, if we were, there are treaties on either side of what Glyphwick works within. For example, right here is the Treaty of 1855. Mille Lacs is a signatory of this one as well, um, and up here as well. So like there is another organization called the 1854 Treaty Authority where um, these nations are also a part of. So um, treaties and reservations span the United States. This is just Glyphwick's purview. At Glyphwick, we have um, a lot of departments, and we also have like administration, finance, IT that are not on this slide. Um, that, in you know, we really deal with the gamut in everything from sea lampreys to emerald ash borer. But I just wanted to show you this quick snapshot of some of the primary work. Um, the way I see it at Glyphwick. Now, if a biologist was here giving you this presentation, it might look a little bit different. Like maybe PIO is way, way smaller, I'm not sure. But um, at Biological Services, these are all the super smart kids are. These are the biologists, and they're testing things and monitoring pollution. They're out in the forest. They're in the field. They're at the boat landings. Um, they also. Um, do tri-state work around Manuman restoration, um, inland fishing, Great Lakes fishing. Those are vastly different um, specialties. Um, enforcement. Um, enforcement are our conservation wardens. They do a lot of outreach. They do a lot of work with kids, um, particularly around um, training around firearms or um, snowmobiles, uh, safety classes, and again, a lot of proactive work around understanding regulations. We don't want people in a position to make a mistake, right? Because when Native people make a mistake, it's not really the same as when non-Native people make a mistake, right? You can, make, you can be made an example. So we want people to have the information they need to safely and legally harvest. They also hold a really popular um, camp for kids from fifth to eighth grade up in the UP. It's stunning. I went for the first time last year. Planning and development um, is, uh, <laughs> I always feel like these are all the smart kids. Like if, when you first come to Glyphoic, these are um, a lot of people that you'll meet first, whether it's an internship. They do a lot of language initiatives and food safety training. Um, they're doing really technical stuff. And then we have the attorneys that do a lot of policy. Uh, we get a lot of calls around line five and things like that. This is the department they go to. Um, uh, half of this office is based in Madison, um, and they put together really outstanding publications. For example, I've listed here the vulnerability assessment. And this is hundreds of pages where they assess the vulnerability of beings and how adaptable or not they are when it comes to climate change. And then there's my, my department, so public information. I spend a lot of time at schools. Um, we do videos and books and state fairs, and we also publish the newspaper, the Mazanai Egan. Does everybody know what that is? That's pretty good. Um, of course, the Ojibwe Treaty rights. Everything over here, please feel free to take whatever you'd like. That's just for you from us. So here's the same map in um, a way that maybe feels more familiar. So what feels off about this map? Go ahead and holler it out. How does this jive or not with the way you're used to seeing this map? Yeah. Your brain wants to organize these linearly, right, where the state lines go. So you can literally see this timeline of expansion as the federal government is moving west. 36, 42, 37, up to 54, you can see them moving west. It's a real illustration of that expansion. 
And as they're moving west, they recognize these native nations with the same reverence as other native nations they have, or other nations they have signed treaties with. So let's talk about sovereignty and what that means. I'm gonna say it first, and then we'll say it together, okay? Okay? Sovereignty is the inherent right to self-rule. Sovereignty is the inherent right to self-rule. It's kind of like if, um, if I met you and I said, I am going to grant you the ability to think for yourself. The little voice in your head, I'm going to allow you to hear that. And you'd be like, what? You can't take that from me. You can't give that to me. And you know what else? I'm going to give you the ability to make decisions about your body, your people, your language, your culture. You're welcome. And you might think, oh, the injustice, because how, how could I not act on my own behalf, my own safety, my family? It's not something you can give people. You, I cannot give or take away your ability to think for yourself. I can't give you permission to be you. And the United States recognized that, that they could not remove Ojibwe people from their own identity. I don't know if they learned it right away, but maybe they know now. Greg Johnson talked about treaty rights being a two-way responsibility, and I just really appreciate that because sometimes I ask kids, who got, who got rights in treaties? Or who did treaties give rights to? And they'll be like, the, the Native people, the Indians. And um, the truth is that answer is complex, right? Because here we have uh, the Treaty of Washington. Um, we have officials come out here and meet with the nations, and they sign this treaty, and everybody goes back to Washington, D.C. They sign it. Ojibwe people go home, and they change the terms while they're gone. We have here the Treaty of 1842, the Treaty of La Pointe, also known as the Copper Treaty. It says a lot about maybe what they were after, right? So on top of these treaties, they start creating states. All of these territories became states within a year, two years of these treaties being signed. So they gain statehood, and they start organizing a government. They start organizing state agencies on top of the ceded territory. And again, here are the reservations, right? Reservations are not real. They were invented. <laughs> they were invented. They are real, and they are sovereign, but they were invented. It's not like they've always been like that, right? So here, 1837 spans across what is now two states. So that can get really complicated, right, when these nations have the right to harvest without any regard for a state agency that might want to get involved, right? Same is true here, 1842. Spans a couple of states. But treaties are what we call the creation of higher authority. They came first and their, their designation is higher, right, at the federal level. So there's your cities, your municipalities, right, that local. Then you have county, state, federal. And that's who has jurisdiction, not the states. So these treaties were signed in 1837. Wisconsin gained statehood in 1848, 10 years later. So if they create a state government 10 years after the treaty was signed with the feds, this is a nation-to-nation -nation understanding. 
state government is lower in authority than federal government, right? Same applies here. So some folks might say, here's the reservation of Fond du Lac. Here's the nation of Fond du Lac. Some people might say, well, sheesh, they got their own reservations. Can't they hunt and fish there? Yeah, you betcha. <laughs> they can. Well, they got all this land all to themselves. I can't go on a reservation. It's not fair. But we have to remember is when the nation of Fond du Lac and other signatories signed the Treaty of 1854, this is the territory they were talking about, not here. This is the area they have a right to, and the government and the courts agree. It's the nation of St. Croix. Uh, here we are um, in Flambeau, in the very heart of ceded territory. Bay Mills, Red Cliff, Bad River. Make sense? Any questions before we move on? Right, right here? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think uh, I, it's also worth mentioning that these boundaries in places are disputed. And, you know, I think it is a good question insofar as like the Ojibwe people were like, okay, here and here, but not here. I don't know. Um, we also have the Oneida Nation down here. We have the Forest Potawatomi down here. Um, so that could encroach on maybe what they have established as well. The other thing I'll just say before we move on, and when it comes to treaty rights, up here, what is the federal government interested in? The North Shore of Minnesota. I heard it, yep. A lot of minerals, right? So there are, um, and I borrow this from Jeff Savage, who is an elder and an expert from the nation of Fond du Lac. Treaty rights, of course, have dual responsibilities and dual benefit. Two parties at the table. There are generations of families who have benefited from mining in that area. Ojibwe people retained the right to be Ojibwe. They retained the right to harvest, to hunt, to fish, to gather across ceded territory. They retained the right to be themselves. And there was benefit, right? So who got rights from the treaties? still complicated. But I always um, remind people that there was a benefit to non-native nations. And Ojibwe people lost a lot, but they retained a lot too. Sometimes when I show this map, people say, oh, that's what, the, that's what it used to look like. No. That's what it looks like today. And they're like, Poof. right? I swear. <laughs> So we'll get into the courts getting involved. So everybody signs these treaties, and 100 years go by where the states have organized and created a government, where they have created agencies to help them regulate natural resources and invasive species and forestry and you name it. 100 years go by and native people are arrested, harvests and boats are confiscated. Um, essentially traditional fishing, traditional living is criminalized. In 1965, we start to have people really rising up. 
And this is not to discredit the many, many other people who stood with a lot of courage. This is just how the record goes in terms of court cases and, and things like that. Um, and I think these people would agree just as quickly. William Boise Jandro, if you, <laughs> if you know Lewis and Clark, if you understand Manifest Destiny, um, your education might be colonized. You should know William Boise just the way you should know Ada Deer. Gets into a confrontation. I think this one is netting. Um, this is out in Michigan. He's arrested, appeals the ticket, and the, the, the courts side with him. His treaty rights are retained. They remain intact. In 1972, Bad River members um, do the same thing. They're willing to get arrested, um, have these confrontations with law enforcement. And um, in 1974, the Tribble brothers in Lakota Ray near Hayward um, also go through the same thing. In 1999, the Mille Lacs Band and several other Minnesota bands um, come together and um, sue the state of Minnesota for infringing on their treaty rights. And... Um, this one goes all the way to the Supreme Court and is decided in a 5-4 vote. The deciding vote was, anybody know? Sandra Day O'Connor had, um, had ties to the Northwoods. She had a cabin in northern Wisconsin. She really understood and took time to understand um, local native people and their harvest and their rights retained. How do you think that vote goes today? <laughs> Scary. Scary stuff, okay. So the Voight Intertribal Task Force um, is formed after the Tribble Brothers challenged this ticket um, and the Supreme Court declined to hear their case. So, you know, it had really moved to the circuit court. Um, and that was a huge victory. And uh, the Mille Lacs case really built on that. Um, any questions here before we move on? Okay. I'm going to do this as gracefully as possible. I am like the oldest millennial. <laughs> <laughs> The beginning for us was when I was young, running around the reservation. We'd hear the elders talk, you hear about so-and-so, he got arrested, got his gun or his equipment confiscated for going off the reservation. It's hard to remember everything after 42 years, every uh, detail. We went to the College of St. Scholastica in Duluth, Minnesota, but I only went one year. I figured I had enough education and then I was going to save all the scholarship monies for younger students. There was an Indian law course, which we signed up for. Our instructor assigned us to research the treaties. We kept coming across an article saying that we retain the right to hunt, fish, and trap on ceded territory. Ceded for us was a key because we were always taught we couldn't hunt off the reservation. One day after class, we stopped our uh, instructor, Larry Leventhal, in the hallway, and we said, hey, Larry, how come uh, we kept researching these treaties and it says ceded territory, and it doesn't say we have to hunt and fish on reservations only. What do we have to do about it? He said, well, we have to have a test case. Oh yeah, a test case, huh? What, what does that mean? He said, that means you have to go out and get arrested. <laughs> So we said, oh, oh, okay, we'll think about it. Well, because it was uh, spearing season, we had all our fish eggs up on the north end of Chief Lake. 
And in Chief Lake, there's an imaginary line right down the middle of the lake. This is off res, this is on res. We knew we'd get sighted for fishing off the res. And so that's what we did. We got up there early, I cleaned out the, the ice that had frozen over again of the hole that we had made the night before. Put my lure down into the water. I seen a lot of fish coming by. I yelled at my brother, I said, hey man, this is a good spot. <laughs> and then I heard the footsteps coming. Thought it was him at first, but it wasn't. It was the game wardens who almost broke the door down to get in there, but I told him I'd let him in. And that led to the citation. About seven to 10 days later, we went to court at Hayward and the judge read the charges and how do you plead? We're not guilty. And uh, the judge found us guilty. You know, prior to this though, a lot of people tried to tell us that we couldn't do it, we wouldn't ever be able to get it done, you know, and they laughed at us. They said, you can't fight City Hall. But we kept trying. But from then on, tribal attorneys took over. We didn't know what was going on until 1983 when we heard that we had won. The impact was a heck of a lot greater than I ever envisioned. I thought we just won the right to hunt fish and certain lakes, you know. Didn't envision it exploding the way it did. There's a lot more spears out there. There's a lot more wild risers out there. Even the schools take the classes out harvesting maple sugar. All things that their ancestors have been doing for generations. It's maintaining a way of life. Fred don't know it, but uh, I did get one or two walleyes out of that hole <laughs> before, before the wounds came. And I, I think it was the evening before. I said, oh man, this is going to be a good spot. Triple brothers are still alive. And I think sometimes that really surprises people because sometimes Native American history is in like a time capsule. This is very recent. Um, I like to say 40 years ago is not that long ago. Um, people were like, well, that's an old case. I'm like, well, it's not that old. Um, and uh, this is really the case that uh, was the impetus for Glyphwick forming. And we have many other videos on our YouTube page that I encourage you to watch. Um, this is one of my favorites, but there are certainly others that depict um, the history of um, a much more violent experience and protests and um, all of the things that people experience when um, misinformation or ignorance um, is the dominant narrative. Seems like Native people sometimes are allowed to be romanticized, but not human. Something I like to point out as well is sometimes there's this narrative of Native people can do whatever they want. There are no rules. They take what they want, do what they want. My response to that is typically, well, if Ojibwe people have a vested interest in spearing and fishing in a way that they want to do it forever, what interest do they have in depleting the resource? Native people often have to, you'll hear the term sometimes walking in two worlds, where um, you know, we have to understand, <laughs> in my case, you know, the story of Tide Woman, and um, all of the protocol um, that I'm expected to know, all the history I'm expected to know, and then all of the other history, American history, that we have to know, and all of those protocols and norms. 
Um, native people, harvesters, you know, sometimes we have to know all of the regulations, all of the laws that the state has implemented that the federal government is um, considering along with off-reservation um, regulations as well. So in the springtime, sometimes things can get really tense when we're talking about spearing. So, so just as... Um, so just as a guideline, this is um, a couple of our biologists. Uh, we got to go, um, well, they let me come electro fishing with them. And you know, every year, Glyphwick biologists do um, an adult population estimate of walleyes in you know, various lakes across ceded territory to understand what the population looks like. Um, you know, what does pollution look like? What um, the health of the uh, the shoreline and are they are walleye um, naturally producing? Is it largely hatchery? Um, understanding all of those metrics, and then we will make recommendations to tribal nations. Again, we don't tell anybody, we don't mandate anything. We can make recommendations based on what we know and what we're seeing out there. Um, when a lake is declared healthy enough to spear, for example, in the spring once the ice, like if winter is gonna let go, um, <laughs> and you know the Wally determined that it's 42 degrees and okay to spawn, um, there are daily permits that spears must take out. There is plenty of regulations and limits and they must be um, sexed and measured and counted. Um, the, it's, it's, a, it's a rigorous creeling process that happens every single night. You heard the tribal council members say they were headed out spearing. It's an all night thing, but it looks different from nation to nation. So um, what one nation declares is not necessarily the same as what might be happening in Michigan or other parts of um, Minnesota. So that's very localized based on those populations that they're seeing. Um, Glyphwick always, does, we also do a lot of work with, um, you know, a lot of partners. We've helped film, you know, pieces with PBS or the DNR. We work with them plenty. Um, always, again, there's a scientific protection and a sacred protection when it comes to these beings. Um, you know, the courts have a real expectation of how we will support tribes. Um, and that is rigorous. So if you ever hear <laughs> there are no rules and they can do what they want, it's just not true. You heard it here. <laughs> you heard it here. Um, I spend a lot of times with kids, so I made this slide however I wanted. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we have a lot of events that, uh, for example, our healing circle run, um, the saying is that every step is a prayer. Um, we walk or run, connecting all of those nations in our membership, um, just um, praying for our communities and our family members that might be experiencing hardships. Um, every year, we recognize the event of Sandy Lake. Show of hands if you've heard of it. A couple folks. In 1850, uh, President Zachary Taylor... Heard of him? <laughs> uh, ordered the removal of all Ojibwe people still living in Wisconsin and Michigan to be removed from their reservations and sent west. The same year, they moved the annuity payments um, out of Wisconsin towards Minnesota, and uh, hundreds of people died making the trip. The government was extremely late to show up and they walked hundreds of miles and um, it's considered one of the most heinous um, acts that Ojibwe people um, experienced. So every year Glyphwick holds an event and all of our membership comes um, to honor those people. Um, I mentioned that our enforcement, they host a camp every year. This is um, a bunch of kiddos with a warden teaching them canoe safety, um, 
which is a really, it's a beautiful camp in the Upper uh, Peninsula, and they um, spend a week there being Ojibwe kids. They start every morning with a spirit run and ceremony, and it's a really beautiful experience. The little cartoon here, if, in case you miss winter, um, <laughs> the, uh, this is seasonal, but I just wanted to pick the winter one. So we have this site, and it's newly launched where... Um, you know, uh, if you wanted to have a book read in Ojibwe, this will read it out loud. All of these four-leggeds have a story. Um, they're printable activities. It's really interactive. And, um, you know, for, for young and young at heart, right, we also recognize the impact of boarding schools. And um, many adult people don't, uh, don't speak Ojibwe for various reasons. And we just recognize that however you learn it, if it's through reading your kid's book or if it feels like a good place for you to start, just start. If you yourself want to um, feature this at a library or something and you're not comfortable pronouncing the words. Now, personally, if I learn to say protosewitz, um, <laughs> um, you can figure it out. <laughs> Um, but the, it will help you pronounce them and things like that. Now, as far as slides goes, I know it's a bad one, okay? But I included it because, because of who you are. And um, you can see the treaties underneath all of this policy, and that's intentional. Smack in the middle. So, so 18... 29, 1886, we have all of these treaties being signed in the background, right? But we also have the federal government creating policies like removal and inventing reservations and the Trail of Tears, the Indian Appropriations Act, Custer's Last Stand, Little Bighorn. In 1850, we have Sandy Lake. We have federal policies around assimilation. We have the Dawes Act that took all those reservations that they just made, and they're like, listen, never mind. Um, here's what you're going to do. Um, so they you know, chop up all the reservations and you know, parcel them out in order um, to create a more individ individualistic outlook up for nations. Then we have reorganizations, right? And you see this with administrations, this knee jerk. We go from one extreme to the next, right? Then we have reorganization. Then we have termination. Somewhere in here, Native people earn the right to vote. Then we have the 1965 Relocation Act. And remember, behind all of this, treaties are being signed. Treaties are being violated. Like, is the ink even dry? Something I want to point out with the Termination Act is the Nation of Menominee. Now, that's a little bit outside of Glyphwick's purview, but I bring it up because sovereign nations were just deleted. That's why you hear terms like federally recognized. They deleted nations from who would have that status. And that's also why I bring up Ada Deer, who um, is also still alive. She was the first woman to head the Bureau of Indian Affairs. She was the first Native woman to run for Congress. And her mother um, fought the feds to have the Menominee Nation reinstated. And the story of the Menominee Nation is really powerful. They were self-sufficient. They had um, hospitals and schools, and they were doing really well until, remember, the Pine Treaty. Those natural resources were really valuable, right? They were expanding their nation. They needed to build homes. They needed to build everything, right? So the Menominee Nation, they're like, you're all, you're all set, right? <laughs> Um, and so Ada Deer um, saw her mother fighting to have the Menominee Nation restored, and um, she spent her entire adult life committed to, to her nation and the recognition of her nation until they were finally reinstated. The other nation that I mentioned earlier was the, the Brotherton Nation, and um, they have never had federal recognition 
So you can imagine the resources and um, you know, different uh, systems that they don't have access to because they have never been deemed federally recognized. They have been fighting for over three decades to earn that recognition. So if you say Wisconsin has 11 federally recognized tribes, that's true. But don't forget about the Nation of Brotherton because they're here too. The other two policies I want to point out to you are ICWA, who's heard of it? More, more people have heard of that. Who knows that it's being challenged in the Supreme Court right now? Who knows this is one of the most important policies that the Supreme Court will hear? Um, this is difficult to talk about, but if you're not really familiar with ICWA, please familiarize yourself. It was passed in 1978. Um, Minnesota has the worst rate of removing Native children from their home. St. Louis County in the 1854 ceded territory has the worst removal rate in the state. We know this, we know the challenge of ICWA is not really about Native kids. We know it's about sovereignty. Um, there's a lot to learn there, so please do that. In the state of Wisconsin, Act 31 passed in 1989 at the height of the walleye wars in the protests on the boat landings, mandating every single school um, create curriculum uh, teaching about their local native nations. Who all knew everything I told them here today? <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of the college campuses I visit ask me the same questions as third graders, and there's no shame in that. I'm just really proud of them for asking. I want to make sure we do Q&A. I want you to feel as safe as this room feels. Um, but I'm not going to let you leave until you are at least trilingual, OK? <laughs> so. We'll have Cheryl at one podium, we'll have Pam at the other. But before we conclude, um, you know, we talk a little bit about um, how recent this history is and how young I am. And, um, you know, I, I'll just share with you um, the difficulties, you know, we, even way up in Alaska where you feel like there must be Native nations and culture everywhere. Um, you know, when you think about things like the gold rush and how um, that, you know, took over the state. And my own grandparents were um, in orphanage and, you know, beat within an inch of their life for speaking Klingit. And um, it made them very afraid to speak their language. And you can imagine how eager they were to teach my mom that language. Um, and how difficult that has made for me to learn, you know, enrolling in college to learn how to speak it and um, making sure that my three daughters speak it. So these opportunities um, are really important and I'm so thankful to be here. So in English, we will say thank you. In Ojibwe, we'll say miigwech. And if you were to say thank you in Klingit, you would say Everybody's like, <laughs> you would say, I'll say it first. Gunakchish. Gunakchish. Thank you so much for having me. Questions? Questions? Come one, come all. Oh, you. Um, concerning the Christian school or the government school that were created, has any compensation been discussed or worked upon by the federal or state governments? Because a lot of suffering has taken place at those schools. And I met one gentleman from uh, I, I just want to make sure I heard the question correctly. Uh, reparations for boarding schools? Yes. Okay. Uh, not that I know of. Um, I, think, I think often what the first step is acknowledging. And I think the secretary, um, Deb Holland, woo -woo, 
Um, <laughs> I think she has done a really good job bringing this issue to the forefront and really leading um, unapologetically. So she has opened a task force around studying and acknowledging boarding schools as well as uh, missing and murdered indigenous women, girls and relatives, as well as removing um, derogatory language from federal land. So she has her hands full um, and I know um, First Nations in Canada are also starting to acknowledge but I, you know, I think this really didn't come to the forefront until there were ghastly discoveries only a couple of years ago. So I think we have a long way to go. Good question. Yep. Um, Buju, I uh, what, just want, want to say thank you so mm -hmm. much, both to the groups that have, have uh, put this together. Thank you so much. But, uh, Jenny, I, I just want to thank you, and really, what I really want to do is make a huge plug for Glyphoid. Mm. Um, my, my friend Marsha and, and co-worker Marsha uh, and I work uh, with the Institute of Indigenous Teaching and mm. Learning here in Waswagane, and we use your materials a lot. So when she suggests that you, you look at what Glyphoid has, when she suggests the videos or the booklets or the whatever, it's fantastic material. So I just want you know, say Chimaquich, thank you so much for, for being here and sharing with us. And this is wonderful material. Chimaquich, thank you so much. <laughs> she's, she's got that anti energy. She's like, I can be loud. <laughs> anti. Oh, hey. <laughs> Go ahead. So maybe you could talk about the special relationship the Ojibwa people have with Nanga mm. uh, and why the population goal of 350 wolves is so offensive to me. Mm. Good question. I will do my best. Um, the question was um, if I could talk a bit about the special relationship with Mayingan or wolf and Ojibwe people. That's a good question. Um, there are creation stories, and I, I don't want to speak anything sacred um, or out of turn, um, but the Ojibwe people feel very strongly tied to Mayingan um, for many reasons, but that there is a deep relationship dating all the way back to creation. And the story goes um, that, you know, man was alone and creator sent Mayingan um, to help name the beings of the world and that they have always walked side by side. And the teaching is that whatever happens to Mayingan will happen to us. And there have been times where it, um, where we have seen wolves hunted and demonized um, in folklore, in, in real life, demonized to near extinction. And we have also seen Native people demonized and persecuted and murdered in canyons with women and children. We have seen similar acts, similar initiatives to extinct both. And we have seen Native people um, thrive. We have seen the wolf return to tend the ecosystem the way that they do. And um, we see those parallels. And um, I want to say two winters ago, February, um, the, the federal, I think under the former administration, the federal protection of the wolf was um, done away with, which sent in a trigger law, right? This also just happened recently in another matter in Wisconsin, where when the federal protection falls, the old state law kicks in, which mandated a seasonal hunt. There was no plan in place. There was no regulation in place. Um, and uh, it was a massacre. 
It was an absolute massacre across the state of Wisconsin. And um, they set a quota, I want to say 119 or something like that. And from what was reported, it was well, well, well beyond. And that was just what was reported. It was an absolute massacre. Um, I won't share all the details, but we know that based on that, the time this happened, um, um, based on the breeding cycle, it was um, a horrific event in the state's history. Um, we know that there is legislation right now being proposed in Wisconsin by um, one of our Congress members to um, have that happen again. We know that wolves don't understand state lines. Um, they're a wild being and need the territory that they need. Um, we, we do have publications or videos that really go into it beautifully, and I'll share those with Beth uh, to share out further. Does that feel okay? Thank you. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Big Rich, for I learned a great deal of it. Oh, thank you. Um, a couple of years ago, I remember hearing how the Ojibwe Nation is helping Lake Minocqua repopulate walleye, or ha helping repopulate walleye in Lake Minocqua. Do the Ojibwe people or the Anishinaabe in ceded territory have any rights, just like the wolves or the walleye, to protect the environment, to kind of maintain it for what you need? That's a good question, and I'll just start by saying yes. Um, sometimes there is a legislative understanding that Ojibwe people have the right to harvest, the right to gather, right, the right to hunt, but don't have the right to protect those resources. Um, and I, I would, I would dismiss that flatly. Um, and. Ojibwe people um, have engaged in many agreements across different organizations and different user groups in order to protect the resource because at the end of the day, that's the priority. Um, but, you know, with that said, um, making sure that Ojibwe people have the right to feed their family how they want to feed their family, when they want to feed their family is a part of their sovereignty. So does that answer your question? Hi. Uh, Hi. My name is Bob Hanson. I'm uh, the 9th District Supervisor for the Vilas County Board. Nice to meet you. Uh, along with uh, Joe Wildcat and Tom Molson, mm. I represent Black to Flambo. And uh, well, in, in response to that last question, I, I do have some information on that. The tribe does have the right to preempt any uh, state or federal legislation that it infringes on tribal sovereignty. Mm, okay. Now, the, the tough part of that is you usually have to do it in federal court, unless you can just say, well, let's go to federal court, and then they, you know, they throw it out. Yes, okay. that's a good clarification. If legislation's coming down that, in, um, or laws or state laws, county laws, that could potentially infringe on that right, absolutely, they have the right to intervene in federal court. Good question, or good clarification. The other, the other uh, thing I wanted to uh, point out and to ask people to help with is uh, this uh, business of attacking people who are out spirit. Uh, after the incident in which uh, Greg Johnson was involved, uh, we did, I drafted a resolution for the county board uh, directing our law enforcement and court system and all county agencies uh, to treat those incidents with the utmost uh, of seriousness and uh, to prosecute them with vigor. And uh, of course, uh, you know, Joe and Tom supported me on that. But what I didn't expect was that it passed the Vilas County Board unanimously. Mm. That's great. Every
we got lots of calls from Nigerian princes. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, and, uh, we, we don't answer any call that we don't recognize. But please, please let me know. Or if you can contact Joe or Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Such a good point about sometimes what can I do? You know. You know their numbers. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, my name is Steve Clinton. I'm a non-native uh, resident of Black Nice to meet you. I've uh, been coming here for 57 years. And I'm trying to come to terms with history. Mm -hmm. We're standing on, as I understand it, the most egregiously checkerboard reservation in the nation. I'm holding an article here from 1922 about the third land sale held in Lac de Flambeau. I think this is the one that took care of uh, Carlingstone. It says the land was made up wholly of inherited properties that had passed through probate. That means those properties were stripped from the families because of tax so there's also the opening up of the reservation lands has brought many new summer people into this part of the lake region. That's a fact. A couple of years ago, I started do some, doing some research on um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, audits of reservations. In the very same year, 1922, the sale was in August of 1922, families were being classified as wards mm. if they were 100% native blood. They were classified as competent if they were 50% native blood. And that was the definition of competent. Competent people could sell their allotted lands, although they were not told about the tax liens that were involved. I look at this today, and it was the same year that the Patronizing BIA agents were classifying people on intimate terms that the land was being sold. How do we, Native and non-Native people, come to terms with this actual history? Good question. Simple question. <laughs> Whatever power you have, whatever voice you have, whatever network you have, lead from behind. Sometimes, um, sometimes I'll ask organizations, how can we help? How can I help? I'll get out of the way. <laughs> um, you know, I guess, I guess I don't have the answer. Because history, in my case anyhow, like never stops hurting. And um, the consequences are still rippling. They're still repeating. However Native nations tell you they want to lead, listen. If, if somebody says, well, we're doing this to honor them or to honor you, and, and they're not into it, <laughs> it's not helpful. Um, sometimes our efforts are misconstrued. Um, sometimes we don't even realize we're talking down to people, or sometimes we don't even realize that we're using a patronizing tone. Um, so just all of those checks that we use when we want to be respectful. Um, I don't know. But in my experience, um, it's OK to just keep asking. It's OK to ask um, Native people what they would like to see. Um, I'm not on my homelands. So um, however this nation determines is the best way to move forward. I'm with you. I'm with them. We can move forward. How they determine we can move forward. Thank you. Good question.
Thank you so much, Jenny. This is why um, the League of Women Voters and AAUW is committed to education, because the only way we're going to answer these questions is if we are uh, lifelong learners and we continue to open up and learn new things, which we all can do and continue to do. And we work hard at listening to the tribes and listening to other people and, and learning, being open to learning all the time. And we hope to bring more and more programs like this to our community so that the dialogue continues and we, we begin to come together at a deeper level as um, shared beings in this space on this floating planet <laughs> with the, the, all of it has uh, a defined space, right, that we have to take care of. Are there any other questions? right here. Okay. Um, what strategies developed over decades by indigenous people and wise elders could be called upon now to help resolve conflicts in our local as well as local communities? Well, there's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that is something we, we see out there, right? There's a different approach to um, fighting for treaties. There can be a different approach to um, fighting systems and working with systems. Um, you know, you might see a, general, a generational divide in your own communities and in Native communities. There's no difference. Um, I think, I think, um, elders have a really good, a really keen talent in listening, in my experience. Um, but being really patient with elders and even approaches that you don't totally understand is, is really necessary. And um, if you ever need, you know, advice on how to petition elders in your community, um, you know, asking people how they would like to be respected is really important. You know, sometimes we hear, well, I really want to ask so-and-so as a knowledge holder to come to this or come to that. You know, how do I do that? And that's totally fair because, you know, I don't know if you all got the protocol memo, right? It's like, well, how do you petition and how do you show respect? Those are all really good questions. And I think, um, I, I think the the dynamic around even respecting elders is something that's slipping away um, in, uh, in all communities. Um, but, you know, lifting up, lifting up those elders, however you do it, is, is really important. Um, and I think, I think elders are always willing to come to the table and be helpful. Um, I just don't know if they're always asked to. So be brave. Petition with tobacco. Kindly. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.